Welcome to the Green Building Show, where we investigate green design and building trends throughout Australia. Hi, this week we're going to kick off a new series on the energy efficient home. We're going to find out what it is exactly, why you should care, we'll focus on the costs involved and we're going to delve into the rating systems and schemes throughout Australia to help you make sense of them. We're also going to bring you some great energy efficient examples. Also in this week's show, we're going to be speaking with design ambassadors Penny Sutton and Peter Yongen, who have brought us their latest ambassador's choice. We'll be speaking with Victoria Lee, who's got a quirky take on green furniture. And in You Asked Us, we're going to address the best materials to withstand those pesky cyclones and earthquakes. But first, to kick off our energy efficient series, I'll be sitting down with Richard Hayes, a professor of architecture from Sydney's University. I'm here with Richard Hyatt, he's a Professor of Architectural Science at Sydney's University. Thanks for being with us, Richard. Good morning, how are you? Very good, thank you, very good. <laughs> so please tell us, Richard, in, in one sentence, what really is an energy efficient home? Well, I think an energy efficient home is largely about um, achieving comfort um, in buildings, largely, within um, particular cost sort of uh, framework and an energy framework. So. It's really using our energy to create comfortable houses. I mean, that's the most Im most important thing. And what, what, what's kind of the, what's the key drivers towards energy efficient homes in Australia? Um, I think the key drivers, uh, as I said, comfort for occupants. I mean, we have to have houses that are comfortable to live in, that kind of service our needs and so forth. But have houses not always been comfortable? Well, not necessarily. I mean, uh, um, for example, the house I live in at the moment um, is it's too hot in summer and it's too cold in winter. And it, it really needs to be retrofitted or changed to actually make it, make it more comfortable. So we've, we think part of, um, part of the energy efficiency equation is trying to make, comf um, trying to make comfortable houses for the least amount of energy that you use, that you that you can use. So you're saying that the driver for energy efficient homes is not so much um, people worry about the impact on the environment or their energy costs, but their level of comfort they're looking for. I think comfort is a ma is a major issue, and basically the idea is that the houses are designed en energy efficiently to reduce the bills, the cost that of that comfort to the um, to the occupants. So if we can, if we put more um, more energy, uh, so to speak, in what we call embodied energy, into the building to make it more efficient in itself, it will cut the demand for energy from, uh, and therefore will cut the utility bills for the um, for the consumers or the occupants, mm -hmm. and that kind of has a massive then massive impact on the on the um, uh, carbon footprint of the building because uh, basically the, most of the fuel that we use in, in our heating and cooling our houses comes from fossil fuels, as we all know. And so for every you know, uh, kilowatt of energy, we save a kilowatt of CO2. So there's a direct relationship between energy efficiency and comfort and the buildings that we live in. And do, you think, do you think we're seeing a, a large shift in the way uh, residential homes are constructed in Australia or in the world? Well, the standards, the standards are moving to improve buildings, um, houses. The, 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 there's government initiatives to push forward the, um, the quality, um, the, high, the performance of the buildings, that, the housing that we live in. The extent to which the rate of progress in that is perhaps debatable, but, the, but there is an extent to, to think about how we can, we can take our, uh, our houses and make them um, more sustainable for future occupants, for future energy needs and so on. And just on um, government policy, is, do you think the government policy in Australia is, is aiding or, or hindering uh, Australia's push into energy efficient homes? Well, the government policy is kind of aligned to uh, internationally. There's international kind of moves to sustainability and so the government's trying to kind of align itself with that. Um, largely trying to use market mechanisms to, uh, we call it, uh, push mechanisms versus pull mechanisms to try and uh, move people's uh, 
um, position on this uh, to move to a more sustainable future. So it's, it's got legislation in place to, to provide for minimum standards for energy performance in houses. It's trying to develop initiatives to, uh, to really... Um, Is that the six star ratings that you... Yeah, it's starting to set up those kind of star ratings on houses to which, which um, really will mandate the kind of level of performance of new construction. Um, what we're interested in is actually how that um, c can be retrofitted back into existing homes um, because a large, you know, there's a large proportion of our building stock is existing buildings and many of those buildings are uncomfortable and energy inefficient. So we kind of, it's a huge market for really um, trying to um, to deal with our e existing building building stock. So what are some of the biggest pitfalls in terms of um, finding what is actually an energy efficient home and what is just greenwash? Well, uh, I, uh, sort of pitfalls tends to be a bit negative, so I kind of like to think about what are the things that we really need to do to make the building, you know, if we're going to retro... What, what needs to be done? In well, if you go on many of the government websites, you'll see that there's lots of advice. Um, you know, this federal government's got the Your Home um, uh, book, which um, is an excellent kind of, excellent kind of, you know, to do, to do kind of manual if you want to, to make an energy efficient house. So if you kind of arm yourself with that, you can really kind of get a, to grips with what what needs to be done. So things like orientation, layout, you know, so insulation, uh, improving insulation, improving thermal mass, a number of, th number of things that um, strategies, improving ventilation, all these things that, um, that in many houses are missing, um, need, we can really start to change that. Now, my feeling is that um, when we're designing these houses, we really need to look at it as an integrated whole. So very often uh, people will say, oh, I need more insulation in the roof, so I'll put more insulation. But then they may not have enough ventilation in the house if the house starts to overheat in summer. So there's a kind of part of the problem with, with moving through this, it, it, we need to look at the building that we're retrofitting or designing a lot more holistically in terms of all how all these strategies really come together to make a, make a building more efficient. As a, so, so as we move up the star ratings, as our star rating schemes get uh, improve their level of performance, I reckon it's going to be really important that we get those synergies going between all those kind of really important to-dos. Okay. And, you know, and, and, who's, and who's pushing this, um, this, this trend towards <coughs> energy efficiency? Is it, is it the, the millionaires with heaps of money to spend on architectural design <laughs> homes? Or is it, the, is it the government, is it the architects themselves? Is it the well, I th I th well, I think a lot of it, we're seeing, uh, one of our research projects is looking at uh, occupant attitudes. And we're seeing a lot of, a lot of um, a portion of the population is becoming more pro-environmental. And they're beginning to select houses based on their environmental performance. Because they're, you know, they're, they think that climate change is a real phenomena, and it's and it's and so for for all sorts of sustainability reasons and for comfort reasons, they're trying to 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 buy higher performance houses, or be in or rent higher performance houses. So that's a kind of the social paradigm, the way we think as a society is really crucial to to moving forward. It, I think in this area, um, so we're seeing that, and um, I think. Um, it's part of the market mechanisms that are now in place. Builders are beginning to understand that there's a section of the population that is more pro-environmental, okay. and they're beginning to design the houses to, to suit that to right. that group. And are you able to give me an indication? You mentioned earlier off camera um, the difference between um, mm. an energy efficient designed home and an energy efficient. Yeah. Home. Yes. Well, the I think this. The standards that we've got, such as the star ratings for houses, um, it's, it's a complex issue, but that's really to help us design, to set standards for the design of houses, new buildings in particular. Now, very often we find that there's a difference between the design of the house, its performance, its theoretical performance, and its operational performance. So when you get into the house, if you have a six-star building, it may not operate at a six-star level. 
because of a whole series of other factors to do with how you use the house, how whether the building was constructed as a specification, a whole series of factors, compliance with legislation and so forth. So this kind of uh, disjuncture um, very often causes quite a bit of frustration for people that are buying these kind of high performance houses. Well, because they expect, there's the expectation that they're going to get a high, a high performance building and they're going to have lower energy costs and better comfort, but then they find that they don't have those things. So how we manage those expectations, I think, is, is clearly, um, clearly important. So what's the solution for that? Well, the government has got a neighbour's home rating scheme now, which is based on operational performance. You can go on the website, you can audit your building and, and find out how it's performing. What it, and put data into it and so on. So that's a really that's a good start for actually helping us to um, to understand what the operational performance of our building is. So what's more important, the, the design or the operational performance? Of the uh, well, we we think it's a it's the whole it's a it's a holistic problem. So if we've got you know if we've got really pro environmental um, people in a house, very green, want to save a lot of energy they're going to have a significant impact on their energy bills and their CO2. Um, if they've then got really good technology in it, so you know, lots of efficient appliances and so on, they're going to ratchet up their performance even more. So we're factoring in behaviour as a, as a major player. It sounds a bit kind of um, a bit quirky, but it's actually it's important to kind of understand these variables in um, in, in using a high performance house. It's like when you've got a car, you can either drive it really fast, where you use lots of fuel, or you can light it slower and you can understand it a bit more, understand its, its traits, and you can get better consumption out of it. So house is a bit the same. Uh, Richard Hyde, thank you so much for your time. Thanks for being with us, Vic. So what have you got on green furniture? All right, yes, um, green furniture is what I want to talk about this week. Um, for years and years we've heard research that plants make you happier, they make you healthier, they make you smarter, everything. So it got me to thinking, and obviously lots of other designers, how green could your furniture actually be? Um, so a wonderful designer, um, Life Design Park in Japan, uh, are selling these fantastic minimalist couches, stroke benches, that actually have incorporated in the design a space for a pot plant. So it's a couch with a pot plant incorporated into the design. That's one kind of level. But taking it much, much further is this brilliant idea from uh, an Italian designer, Fiore Arcangelo, which has a plant literally inside the chair. Um, it's inspired by the idea of, uh, the idea of uh, terrariums, if I've said that right, which are indoor gardens, which generally live inside glass or plastic. So you're literally sitting on a plant, which I think is great. And then taking that even further, it's an idea you do see around a little bit, but again, from Italy, fantastic idea is um, the Terra outdoor chair. It arrives flat packed, it's cardboard, strong cardboard, unpack it, erect it, put it in your garden, fill it with soil and earth and some um, grass seeds, water it, and lo and behold, fingers crossed, you've got your, literally your own garden chair that is growing in your garden, completely covered in grass. That's it this week, livable furniture, green furniture taken to a new step. I'm here today with Penny Sutton and Peter Youngen, our design ambassadors. And we're here talking about the Middleton Beach unit block, which is a residential project um, in Western Australia's Middleton Beach in Albany. So tell us, um, Peter and Penny, why did you choose this project for your ambassador's choice and how do you think it reflects a light home? First, it's because we have been looking at multi-residential units and high-density living. Um, it's quite relevant to the Australian climate in terms of cost of construction, cost of actually owning a home these days, um, on, and on top of that, in terms of land use. So this is um, a personal interest of our own as well. And what do you um, think the architect has done particularly well? Um, in, in this case, it's a building designer, it's not actually an architect. Um, the, what, what, but what Terence managed to do here is um, really balance um, the, the density and uh, the, the open space um, of this particular site. Um, 
I guess they they could have fit fitted four units on. And if you're looking from a developer's point of point of view, a lot of the times what happens is they look out there the bang for the buck or the, the most amount of return that they can get. And this particular um, project, um, the client and the, the designer really worked hard to ensure that there was a nice balance of outdoor space and also um, you know, a cost-effective solution. So um, we're, we're really quite interested in that. Um, because that, that allows for you know, solar access and a whole heap of other um, sort of impo- important ac- aspects to, to, to come into the um, in, into the development, you know, lifestyle, sense of community, um, you know, garden spaces, um, and, and security. This is a whole heap of issues that um, a lot of the time um, aren't handled particularly well because projects are driven more by how much profit and um, not about lifestyle. Okay, great. Thanks, uh, Peter. And looking at the photos, it looks like a real, uh, quite a modern design. I guess what was the what was the main drivers for this project? The clients were actually farmers, so the, these are actually holiday homes for the client, and um, they jointly own a block of land. Um, instead of placing the maximum number of units that they could on the land, they actually placed the units um, in a way that gave them open spaces and lifestyle and an individual feel to each unit. This week, we've got a question from Romina, and she's building a house in Vanuatu where cyclones, earthquakes and humidity are serious problems. Weatherboard would actually be a good solution for this, Romina, as it can handle all types of weather extremes. Weatherboard's got a number of advantages in extreme weather conditions, such as its ability to flex, its um, ability to handle large amounts of water, and also, and even its resistance to fire. To illustrate this point, in 2005, Hurricane Katrina struck the, uh, the Gulf Coast of the US, and it destroyed almost 15,000 homes. But there was a little bit of good news to come out of this destruction. A homeowner named Larry even though he was in the middle of all this destruction, came home to find his home actually still there. And he credited that, that stroke of luck to the fact his home was built with hardy plank. Other houses nearby that are standing where they didn't have solid hardy plank or something like that, even the brick house down the street, the brick collapsed. And Weatherboard also holds up pretty well on the cost front. According to a cost comparison published in the Smarter Green book, uh, a square metre of brick veneer, say, will cost you about $183, while a square metre of Skyon Linear will cost you only $140.